my name is Tom Gilligan, and I'm the Dean of the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas. Uh, we've gathered here today to talk about the economy on the occasion of uh, the 100-day anniversary of the Obama administration. We have a distinguished panel of guests with us today, and I'd like to introduce them before we begin. On my right, your left, uh, we have joining us Daniel Hammermesh. Uh, Daniel is the Sue Kilman Professor in the Foundation of Economics at the University of Texas at Austin. His research concentrates on labor demand, time use, social insurance programs, and unusual applications of labor economics. A regular free economics blogger for the New York Times, Hammermesh illustrates how economic principles can be found everywhere, from time use to political rhetoric to family dynamic dynamics. To his left and my right is James K. Galbraith. James holds the Lloyd M. Benson, Jr. Chair in Government and Business Relations at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Galbraith is, Galbraith is the author of several books, his most recent, The Predator State, How Conservatives Abandon the Free Market and Why Liberals, liberals Should Too. To my left is Sheridan Tittman. Sheridan is the holder of the McAllister Chair in Financial Services in the Department of Finance at the McComb School of Business. He has developed a national reputation for his research on corporate finance, investment, and real estate. I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists for joining us today. To begin, James, why don't you give us uh, a summary of where we are, uh, what's gone on in the economy prior uh, to the inauguration of the new president, and the basic step they, steps they've taken to try to address the economic challenges that the country faces. Well, this has clearly been a very dramatic period, uh, one in which uh, uh, Events were kicked off by a very severe financial crisis uh, that originated in, uh, in the housing sector, but then basically spread through uh, the banking system, the global financial system. Uh, the reaction in the real economy was a very violent reduction of uh, production, a uh, fall in auto sales on the, on the order of 40, 50 percent, and the uh, fall in uh, housing construction and in housing prices of similar magnitudes. Uh, that's uh, larger and more serious than I think most of us have seen in our professional lifetimes. And so the new president came in uh, in a condition of real um, emergency of crisis. Uh, the, in the first weeks of the new administration, the Congress enacted a, an expansion package, a stimulus package, uh, that was uh, large by historical standards. Uh, whether it was large enough move quickly enough, it was targeted in the right way to give us a kind of very, a, a kind of rapid recovery uh, that um, we would like to see is, I still th mm -hmm. think, very questionable. Um, the President has also, and the Treasury Department have also um, introduced a plan uh, for dealing with the problems of the banking sector. Um, and again, uh, many people, including myself, have questions about uh, the, uh, the efficacy of that program going forward. Uh, but it still seems likely that uh, given the scale of the, of the expansion package and given the uh, uh, automatic stabilizers that are at work in the economy, mm -hmm. the reduction in tax revenues, the increase in unemployment insurance, uh, the uh, liquidation of inventories, mm -hmm. that we will see at least a stabilization and perhaps a modest improvement mm -hmm. going forward, that we may be at the bottom a very severe contraction. Mm -hmm. uh, the test of policy and uh, going forward will be uh, how quickly can we yeah. come off the bottom. Right, right. Dan, you're a specialist on labor markets, and we've had a, just a dramatic and striking increase in unemployment in the country over the past year. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the impact of that on the, on the macro economy, whether or not you think the public policy that's in place now is adequate to address the human suffering associated with unemployment, and whether current policy contributes to recovery or exacerbates the decline in the economy. Sure. Let's just get some perspective on it first, although Jamie covered a lot. Uh, this will be, I think, by July, the worst recession since the 1930s in terms of the rise in unemployment. It's going to be over five percentage points. The low was 4.4 four early in 2007. I don't think it'll go to 10-0, but it's going to be very close to that. My guess is this will bottom out in June or July. Uh, having said that, there are a number of unusual things about this recession, which I think are going to make the recovery, regardless of what we do on policy, very slow. In particular, unemployment among men has risen 
50 percent more than among women. It's unique in all post-war recessions. At the same time, men are participating less in the labor force by a lot. There's been a huge withdrawal of men from the labor force. Uh, when things start recovering, all those folks and more are going to come back in looking for jobs. That's going to prevent unemployment from falling very rapidly. In terms of whether the policy has been sufficient, we're in a very, very difficult place. On the one hand, the standard thing to do is to cut taxes. That's a standard stimulus thing. The problem with that is we've been cutting taxes an awful lot in the last 10 years. At the same time, uh, we have to have tax revenues in the future for the tremendous growth in transfers that's mandated to help protect me, for example, when I mm -hmm. retire in a few years. So I just don't see much leeway. The one thing we could do, which has been talked about, albeit nowhere nearly as much as it should be, is to cut or leave taxes alone for people up to 100000 and not just raise the tax rate to 39% for those earning more than 250000 but go to 41 or even 43 or 45, which will go part way toward restoring after-tax income equality that's been severely damaged at the upper end by the tremendous increase in the returns to work mm -hmm. for the very, very high earners, like a lot of the people around this table. Mm -hmm. We've made out very well, not just because of Bush's tax cuts, but because of natural forces in the economy. It's mm -hmm. been going on for 15 years. What's amazing to finish up is that the rise in inequality between the folks in the 98th percentile and those in the 90th has been as high in the last 15 years as from the 90th to the median. Mm -hmm. There's been a huge pulling outward of the upper tail of what people make, mm -hmm. and this needs to be re redressed somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheridan, could you join in the conversation and give us a sense of uh, your understanding of, of how deep the challenges are in the economy these days, and could you bring your expertise on capital markets markets to bear? Uh, the capital markets probably have uh, seen s the biggest upset they've seen in 50, 60, 70 years. It's not clear capital markets are functioning uh, in terms of lending uh, to firms and consumers. Uh, the federal government and the Obama administration is actively uh, looking to advance the policies uh, in the banking sector. Are those policies sufficient to help usher us into a new growth phase in the economy? Okay. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, first, just to comment on what Professor Hammermesh was saying, um, I definitely agree that we clearly do need fiscal stimulus, and um, if people are going to be buying fewer cars and fewer houses, then we need to do something to have people consume in other ways. Um, I think we need a serious discussion on how we want to change consumption. And I can understand the arguments that, you know, instead of consuming more cars and houses right now, um, we should be consuming more parks, better roads, uh, more research and development. Um, other types of goods and services that would, in fact, be provided by government. And as a result, um, we will have, you know, larger government expenditures and, um, of course, larger deficits. Um, but I do think we need to think very seriously about, you know, the nature of that government spending, um, not just blindly spending because we have a recession. Um, think about what exactly we want to be doing. Um, you asked me about financial markets, and um, there's sort of a, a view that you're seeing in the press that the banking crisis is what caused the recession, and I'm not sure I would agree with that. I think the real cause was the collapse of the housing market, and in some sense, the restructuring of the auto market. Okay, these are two of the very largest sectors in the economy, and when both of those sectors go south, um, I think Jamie said that auto sales is down 50 percent. Um, new construction on housing is down, you know, perhaps more than that. When that happens, um, you're going to have a recession, and you're likely to have a large recession, even in the absence of a banking crisis. Um, the example that I like to use is Spain. Um, the banks in Spain um, were not misbehaving right. in the same sense sense as the banks in the United States. Um, the major banks in Spain were not investing in subprime mortgages. Um, they weren't doing crazy things. The Spanish banking sector was in reasonably good shape um, prior to the recession. Now, of course, you know, they're having problems, but um, the recession in Spain obviously did not come from the banks, but the housing sector in Spain is probably the worst in the world. 
And what we see now is that the unemployment rate in Spain is moving towards 15 percent. There's some people will say unemployment in Spain will go to 20 percent. Um, this is a housing-related recession, um, and simply fixing the banks isn't going to fix the problem. Um, having said that, the banks are obviously broken, and, um, and we have been very slow in our reactions to the banking crisis. Um, and I'm not sure we can blame Obama for this. The, the banking crisis started, you know, probably more than a year ago. And, and there was very little interaction. Um, uh, interaction isn't the word, but um, inter supervision, supervision, whatever <laughs> you want to say. Um, very little was done after Bear Stearns went down, and things just simply got worse and worse. Um, I think that instead of uh, the type of bailout bill that was discussed in in the fall, um, I think we should have thought about. Uh, new bankruptcy laws for banks. Um, we should have recognized that Citibank, um, Merrill Lynch, you know, they may have been dead banks that needed to be substantially restructured rather than um, injecting new capital into mm -hmm. the banks. Um, we should have had um, done something. I guess my main concern is that in the past year, um, we've been arguing that the banks are too big to fail. Mm -hmm. And the reaction to that is to make the banks bigger and bigger. <laughs> uh, we've got Bank of America that now has swallowed up um, Merrill Lynch. Um, WAMU is what part of Wells Fargo? Is mm -hmm. it? Um, Wachovia is Wells Fargo. Wachovia is Wells Fargo. So the big banks have gotten bigger. So mm -hmm. we're certainly not moving in the direction to solve this sort of too big to fail problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is something that needs a little, a little bit more serious thought. Um, hopefully, Jamie will have something uh -huh. more to say about that because I know that he's been looking at banking regulation a lot more carefully than All I right. have. All right. Let me bring Bernie in. Uh, we've been joined by Bernie Black. Uh, Bernie is the Hayden W. Head Regents Chair for Faculty Excellence at the University of Texas Law School, and he's also a professor of finance at the Macomb School of Business. Uh, Bernie, we're just going around trying to let everybody give their general perception of the depths of the decline in the economy and what some of the major problems are. and and comment a bit on the appropriateness of contemporary economic policy towards remedying the problems. Share with us your views on that. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do is look out a little bit longer, if I can. So fine, we're in a recession. We're in a bad recession. Mm -hmm. um, standard policy is boost government spending, run deficits for a while. Um, we may be doing a half-ass job of that. We're half botching it, but we're kind of trying. But in the long run, um, it's not clear that a bigger government is the road to long-term economic health. And after a long period of relative fiscal restraint, um, Bush was bad and Obama is worse in terms of the long-term growth in federal spending. Now, Obama may not be able to achieve all that he wants to spend because um, he'll run out of money to do it. Uh, if he tries to do it, he'll run up horrendous long-term deficits to add to the long-term, you know, sustained transfer-based uh, deficit. And I'm really worried about that. And I'm worried about that now because I suspect that that's part of what is affecting people's views about the medium term and the long term and therefore affecting the recovery now, which is the long-term plan just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't balance. Um, Obama is playing games with smoke and mirrors on his uh, long-term forecasts. And if you look at what he's spending on, frankly, a lot of it doesn't make any sense to me. We ought to be figuring out how to invest more. And instead, we're figuring out how to spend more on old people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the short run, maybe that's okay, but in the long run, taking more dollars from the young and spending them on health care for the old is not, mm -hmm. in my view, the way to long-term prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that we could take a third out of our health care spending tomorrow and have negligible effect on quality. We don't have the political guts to do it, and we're not moving in that direction mm -hmm. at all. We're moving in the direction of... Uh, of more spending. 
Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that Obama is doing make sense. Electronic medical records are important, but um, covering more people in a broken health insurance system mm -hmm. is not the long-term answer. Mm -hmm. The drugs are continuing to go up by double-digit prices every year. It is mm -hmm. clear that the drug companies will, in the medium term, if not sooner, basically break the bank if we let them. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not going to do it one year at a time. They're just going to keep raising prices 10, mm -hmm. 15, 12, 20 percent on average. Individual drugs will go up 400 or 500 percent because mm -hmm. nobody who really has a finite pocketbook is paying. The federal mm -hmm. government is paying. Mm -hmm. And all they're doing is testing our political willingness to pay for increasingly marginal right. treatments. So I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the divide between people who pay taxes and people who don't. So we already have a system where half the people in the country basically pay no income tax. Mm -hmm. And some of the tax reform proposals would increase that. And I'm worried about that because then the people who aren't paying tax are not going to be making good decisions about the, the trade-offs between mm -hmm. spending and taxing. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I am much more pessimistic than Dan is about our ability to tax the rich because they can run away. It's really hard to tax capital income. It's going to get harder to tax uh, labor income at the very top end for people who can live anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the right trade-off is. There are models of optimal taxation that say that optimal tax rates should drop as sure. income gets, gets very high because of the avoidance opportunity or the trade-off between work and leisure. So I'm worried about that. Uh, I'm worried about the lack of bipartisanship in Obama's approach to legislative reform. Mm -hmm. um, as best we can tell today, uh, his talk about bipartisanship was pure smoke and mirrors. There's no sign of follow through. There's no sign of, of real willingness to, uh, to compromise. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a long-term problem because mm -hmm. it's going to lead to bad legislation. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about the next crisis being built on the moral hazard of today, the, the too-big-to-fail problem in the financial sector that Sheridan talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, the expectation that the big banks will get bailed out is even stronger than it was. And the systems to control their incentives to take risks for short-term gain mm -hmm. are, are not in place, and what they are is not obvious. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know what to do. Mm -hmm. We know that more regulation just by itself is not the answer. It's got to be smart regulation. Mm -hmm. God knows Fannie and Freddie were regulated. Mm -hmm. They were regulated up the wazoo. That didn't help and it might have hurt. Right. Uh, so just more regulation isn't what's called for. Yeah. And then maybe in the near term I want to throw out one idea that has struck me as just so obvious that mm -hmm. I don't know why it doesn't get done. So if you've got a corporation that's worth a hundred million dollars and it has two hundred million dollars in debt, we reduce the debt to a hundred million. Mm -hmm. If we have a homeowner who has a house who's worth 100000 and he's got a mortgage of 200000 we should do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We should have a bankruptcy process to say you can go into bankruptcy, mm -hmm. you can reduce your outstanding loan to what the lender could realistically collect. Mm -hmm. If they tried to foreclose, they wouldn't get 100000 they'd get 50 or 75. Mm -hmm. Give them the claim on the 100, reduce the principal to 100, give them a real interest mm -hmm. rate that's a real market rate, not some escalating rate that nobody ever expected to be able to pay. And that might provide a road to housing recovery. Mm -hmm. It'll help everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, the banks can't individually do it. Exactly why is not entirely clear, but it's clear that they won't. Mm -hmm. We have to have a fi figure out yeah. a way to break through that logjam. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Um, Bernie brings up brings up a really interesting point. I mean, at some level, this is a micro, it's a macroeconomic issue. How much to spend? Who should pay for it? What, what should we spend it on? But there are some very large microeconomic policy issues: healthcare policy. Uh, real estate sector and bankruptcy issues. What is, what is your thinking on whether or not, whether we have to solve or address in a major way some of these very big microeconomic policy issues like healthcare, real estate markets, maybe even energy sector, uh, has a precursor to solving and preparing our economy to a return to uh, sustainable growth rates? James, why don't you well, let Well, let me first of all <laughs> just come back at you on a, on a few points. I mean, of course, I share your concern about drug prices. It was a mistake made by the Bush administration to forbid Medicare 
from negotiating with drug companies over prices. It was, was already a seat. That was yeah. part of what yeah. the Bush administration insisted on when they put in Medicare Part D. It was mm -hmm. clearly a mistake. I share the concern about uh, health care costs and agree with you that we could reduce health care costs without uh, uh, affecting health status. A very significant way to reduce the cost of health care in the country would mm -hmm. be to move from this current patchwork of insurance schemes to a single publicly provided insurance system. The very large part of the overhead in the healthcare system comes from the fact that we alone mm -hmm. in the, uh, amongst the major industrial countries pay for an enormous burden of private, uh, in, mm -hmm. uh, private health insurance. On the question of taxes, and you mentioned something about a uh, large part of the, peop of the population no longer paying the income tax, but it's very important to remember that for the working population of the United States, the payroll tax is in most cases a bigger burden than the income tax, and the payroll tax goes down as a share of your income uh, amongst the amongst high earners and doesn't apply at all to income that comes from uh, sources mm. other than labor. Uh, so in thinking about how to balance out the, uh, uh, the, the tax burden, we have to remember that it is already uh, substantially regressive not only because of the federal payroll tax, but also because at the state and local level, sales taxes and so forth fall disproportionately on consumption and not at all upon uh, uh, savings and not at all upon very little, l much less amongst on high earners. So I'm very much with, with Dan on the view that when we talk about what should be done about taxes in the short run, we should emphasize uh, the working population. And I think the sensible thing to do uh, would be uh, to extend uh, the credit against the payroll tax that was already enacted, basically declare a holiday on the payroll tax for the duration of the crisis. Let the government write a check to the trust fund so that that accounting is taken care of. Uh, but give working people a substantial me short-run, medium-term uh, benefit that they can use to help pay their mortgages, to help pay their car payments, mm -hmm. uh, to get restore the, the finances of the household sector. Mm -hmm. On the question of bipartisanship, well, this. It, I think any, anyone with a memory of three months would, go, would know that the administration <laughs> made an enormous effort to reach out, particularly to the Republicans in the House, and they did not come across with a single vote mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, opening. They didn't give a, a single earnest of good faith cooperation mm -hmm. to this administration coming in. Mm -hmm. Very different mm -hmm. from how the Democrats treated uh, the Bush administration uh, mm -hmm. in 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question of bipartisanship seems to me is a, uh, is a bum rap on this administration, a mm -hmm. very bum rap. I do believe uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the deficits are large now and that that is not only inevitable, given the depth and violence of the, um, of the slump, the fall off in incomes and the fall off it, therefore of income mm -hmm. taxes, uh, but also uh, a good thing. Mm -hmm. the, the less that government is taking in in tax revenue, mm -hmm. the more that it's putting out in expenditure, uh, the more quickly the finances of the household sector, whose savings are exactly all that correspond to the public deficits as an accounting matter, uh, the more quickly that they, they mm -hmm. will come back and have the savings rate is going up, has mm -hmm. gone up very sharply, but, I mean, but households also have as a result of this some income that they can mm -hmm. spend, so it helps stabilize the economy. Mm -hmm. And then finally, on the question of housing and what's going on in the banking sector, it seems to me one thing that we have to recognize is absolutely central uh, to the banking problem uh, is that this problem originated in a massive wave of fraud. Uh, there was the, 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 or the origination and marketing of subprime securities was infested with fraudulent practices. Mm -hmm. Uh, and until we come to grips with that, and I think the administration has not fully come to grips with it uh, in, for example, the stress test that they're now putting the banks through, uh, we will not be in a position to honestly and effectively mm -hmm. uh, rectify the balance sheets of the banks. Mm -hmm. Daniel, one or two ideas that you would recommend the Obama administration mm -hmm. uh, undertake to address this issue? Let me give a general overview of the ideas and then try to respond to some of the things I've heard around the table okay. here. And I promise not to join Jamie in jumping on poor Bernie across the table <laughs> over here, <laughs> although it's very tempting indeed. Uh, the discussion 
talks about sort of long, mi middle term and long term issues. We're in a recession. I find it very annoying that people talk about and the administration talks about trying to do something about issues 30 or 40 years down the road. The only thing we should be thinking about is that we don't tie our hands so much that we can't deal with them after we're out of this recession mm -hmm. five years down the road. Mm -hmm. So my only concern about the long term is don't do something that puts you in the wrong path to dealing with those issues. But solving Social Security, solving health, health problems, these are wonderful things. And we've made lots of mistakes. But I don't want us, given a limited political will to do anything ever in this country, to be worrying about that right now. Let me make a few comments on things I've heard around the table. Sheridan talked at some length about the bankruptcy issues for the banks, which he's absolutely right on. I find it reprehensible that the administration has gone so far to try to bail out failed companies like Chrysler to benefit a few rich investors who happen to own it and the UAW or GM. To me, the bankruptcy laws were designed precisely for companies like that to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And they should have done that long ago rather than pouring more and more money in. Or now, as I gather, you and I are going to be 50% owners of GM, <laughs> which none of us would dream of buying for our own portfolio if we had the choice. <laughs> but you know, bankruptcy was designed for these guys. They ought to go into bankruptcy. Uh, other things, nobody's mentioned that we are in the state of Texas here. Uh, mm -hmm. People may not know that, but we are in the state of Texas. And it's good to have a local perspective on things, being Texans. Uh, at least some of us are Texans anyway. On why the recession here is a bit different from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I hear all the time the recession hasn't hit in Texas anywhere near as bad. It's not going to. Right. The reason is simply because we didn't have a housing bubble. I think mm -hmm. Sheridan talked about the housing bubble. One of you guys did. Mm -hmm. And that's a major, one of the two causes of what I call this double-barreled recession. We didn't have one here. For that reason, more than any other, we're not having a severe recession. I've heard the governor say and various right-wing politicians say, we haven't had a bad recession because Texas is a low-tax, low-spending state, mm -hmm. which sounds wonderful. It will be great in the Republican primary next March. And it is completely far from the truth. It's nowhere near the truth. And indeed, the best evidence of that, which I think people ought to know, is that it must be the case that in the last recession, Texas was a high-spending, high-tax state, because in that recession, unemployment rose more than it did nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, just a totally fraudulent argument. But the main point I want to stress again is that we need to think about the short term, and we not mm -hmm. think about these important, vital issues at a time when we've knocked about 8 million people out of employment okay. and growing. All right. Sheridan? Um, I guess I don't quite agree with the idea that we need to just think about the short term. Um, I think there's some long term issues, and some of the long term issues will help us in the short term, and some may not. Um, one thing I'd just like to mention is um, energy policy, for example. I would view that as a very, very long term issue. And, and we've talked about taxes, for example. Um, and there's some disagreement. I don't completely agree with this idea that raising taxes is going to kill the economy. I don't think there's really strong evidence that raising you know, top marginal rates from 35 to 40 percent is going to have a major effect. Um, but one thing that we haven't brought up is the fact that um, we will, in fact, one way or the other, have very large taxes on energy, um, carbon taxes, whatever we want to call them. We're going to have very large taxes, and for some reason, um, that has become politically more difficult because of the recession, um, because the tax word has somehow become a dirty word. And the idea is, you know, this isn't the time to take money out of the economy. I actually think this is the perfect time uh, to institute the carbon tax one way or the other. Um, the, you know, what we learn in Economics 101, and I guess this is somewhat what Bernie was saying, is that we don't want to tax things um, in ways that are going to distort behavior. So Bernie's concerned about if we, you know, raise top marginal tax rates to 45 percent or whatever, um, it's going to cause people to work less. They're going to shift income in various ways. Um, these are things that I'm a little bit skeptical of myself, but that's one of the concerns. Um, if that is a concern, we need to think very carefully on what we want to tax um, and how do we design taxes in ways that get people to do what we want them to do, not what we don't want them to do. 
and the energy tax is just simply a no-brainer. Um, mm -hmm. We want people to drive less. Um, we will tax gasoline. Um, the U.S. has one of the lowest taxes on gasoline um, in the world. Um, I don't think it's good. I think there's disruptive effects associated with big changes in taxes. Um, but I'd like to see an additional tax of gasoline on gasoline of about a dollar a gallon today and raising it in five years to two dollars and in ten years to three dollars a gallon. Hmm. And we're going to see larger taxes on electricity um, that's produced from fossil fuels. Um, the interesting thing in terms of the debate is that people are seeing this as, gee, you know, when you add it all up, we're going to be bringing in another $100 billion in tax revenue, and that's viewed as a negative. I view that as very much a positive. It helps us in the short run because we're doing lots of things that are creating deficits. This is going to offset that deficit spending, and in the long run, it's going to um, move us towards a more sustainable um, energy future. Let me comment briefly on that, if I might, okay? okay. Just one thing. Very on briefly, this. then we have I to have Bernie. Very it's simple rebuttal point. time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is an especially good time to impose a gasoline tax of the Ross Perot 50 cent, and I'd like a dollar. We had $4 gas just a year ago, if you remember. Mm -hmm. People, nobody likes higher prices, but to go from 2 to $3, which a $1 tax would do, at a time when it had been 4 I think is the least disruptive possible, and it's absolutely necessary. You're absolutely right on that. Can I just make a comment on Please. this? Phasing here is absolutely essential. Uh, what you spoke about was raising it substantially more in five years and more in 10. Right. What you need to do is take advantage of the time frame uh, that we're talking about to make the kinds of investments that will give people alternatives mm -hmm. uh, to private automobile transportation and to use those investments as a vehicle both to provide employment, uh, which is desperately needed, and uh, to provide a kind of direction and focus for private business investment going forward. In other words, to build an economy which is doing certain things that need to be done. And it seems to me this strategy really has to be thought through, and here I have a slight difference with Dan, because it seems to me it has to be thought through as a medium to long-term proposition. Because if we don't achieve uh, some stabilization of, the, of our energy security and some, mm -hmm. some control over the price of, of, of petroleum going forward, uh, what's going to happen is that the uh, speculative forces will kick back in as soon as the economy is recovering, and we may see a r r rising prices, inflation, policy reaction to that, which could curtail the expansion that we would need to get back to high employment. And the final point I'd make on this mm -hmm. is that if we're going to move taxes uh, or other economic burdens on the energy sector, then the right way to compensate for that, or one of the right ways to compensate for it, is to take the tax burden off of labor. Yeah, I think what you're yeah. saying is that we, I guess what we're agreeing on is we need a tax on energy. Um, it needs to be phased in for the reasons that both yeah. Jamie and I agree with, because there's a transitional cost. And um, I think what Jamie's emphasizing is the energy tax will be regressive in a, in a lot of ways. And as a result of that, we're going to have to offset the regressive nature of the energy tax um, by making perhaps income taxes more progressive or, or something else. I would, I would cut the payroll tax. Mm -hmm. it's the easiest way we to can talk that. about that later. Yeah. yeah. Bernie? So I'm going to take a risk and agree with everybody. <laughs> we, we need energy taxes. We need them to be phased in. I might do it 10 cents a gallon per year for going out as far as you can see, going out for 40 years if you mm -hmm. want. I, I don't think I'd give the a big shock right now because there are too I many middle-income people driving big gas guzzling vehicles, especially in Texas. Uh, it's a Texas tradition, but absolutely, we, we should do it, we should phase it in, and we should use that as that's a better way to raise mm -hmm. taxes for the foreseeable future than higher marginal rates on, mm -hmm. on income. Um, if we want to think short term, I want to come back to we've got to do something about the gazillions of people, there aren't so many in Texas, who are in upside down mortgages and have no way out. And I'm just not seeing that being addressed seriously. I'm seeing it being talked about, but I'm not seeing it be addressed. And we have a housing-led crisis. Now, dumb bank lending fueled the bubble and then fueled the housing crisis, and then so we've got a bank crisis as well as a housing crisis, but at the core, 
we've got a housing crisis and we've got to address that square on and we're not yet doing so in my view. Uh, with regard to health care, I agree with the strategy of not doing something now that would be really dumb long term and that's precisely what I'm worried about. In the long run we have two broad ways to go in, in health care. We can creep toward the government pays for more and more and or we could try to do something that would be radical that would give people cost incentives at the margin. McCain came very close to a truly radical health care proposal of give everybody enough money to buy good catastrophic care insurance, um, subsidize the high cost people or spread it through, uh, through, through a requirement to take all comers, um, and then figure out what to do for cost that's less than catastrophic that I think would have been dramatically effective over the medium or long term in reducing cost. What we're moving toward instead is more of the Medicare, Medicaid model, which is high cost, lousy quality incentives. And I just don't see that as the way to go. Great. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming today and talking about the difficult challenges our country faces. Uh, Daniel, James, Sheridan, Bernie, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, goodbye from Texas. Thank you.